and now i look like a genius right <laughs> but you know back then it's not the same so i think crypto has given me that thick skin to handle cynicism i just tell people who really are cynical about it and negative about it that they don't have to care about it right like go do something else hey folks i'm adam bilavine and this is speaking of bitcoin Today we've got a special episode for you so we'll get right into it. As always I'm joined by the other host of the show, Stephanie Murphy. Hi. And Andreas M Antonopoulos. Hello. Jonathan Mohan is out today. On this episode of Speaking of Bitcoin, we're joined by Vignesh Sundaresan, a past guest of the show and the real life personality behind Metaverse and the Metacoven, let's call it Avatar. For those of you who haven't been following closely, Metaverse is the fund that earlier this month won the Christie's auction, the Beeple first 5000 piece. So he's got the dual distinction of outbidding Tron's Justin Sun and also of having spent the third largest amount of money ever on a piece of art from a living artist. Metacoven, thank you very much for joining us today and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So, let's take the opportunity to kind of zoom back out from India and get a little bit more specific on kind of the moment that we're in right now because as we kind of were discussing in earlier parts of this conversation, NFTs and collectibles and blockchain stuff is having a bit of a moment now. And it didn't really start with people, but I would say that that was sort of the last biggest event. I would actually argue that this kind of started with the NBA Top Shot project, which frankly was the thing that started getting me really excited over the early part of the year. Because, you know, for as long as we've been talking about tokens and as long as, you know, I've personally been working on token projects, The thing that's always been that kind of eventual goal is going effectively mainstream, right? Is taking these ideas that a small number of enthusiasts are very passionate about, willing to jump through the hoops, willing to, you know, brave kind of the metaverses before there's anything really there. And so, I'm not a sports guy. I don't particularly care about basketball, but just the interest and the kind of grasp that I think that we saw come out of that and are continuing to see today told me that something was different. that you know what i had looked at for the last number of years something had changed over the last couple of months and now i'm still kind of trying to look around the environment and see what has happened but before i throw it back to you i want to put kind of another part on this which is that you know it's not about the price for us but it's about the price for a lot of people and you know people on an interview that he did shortly after the sale made a comparison to kind of the dot com era and you know how although there was a dot com bubble and people paid silly amounts of money for like investing dot com and stuff like that right that even though there was this collapse the technology wasn't the problem it was the speculation on the technology that was the problem and it was sort of the run up in excitement and sort of a fomo around it so i mean talk about the current moment that we're in with nfts as you see it and then talk about kind of what you think comes next after this you know not far into the future as we've perhaps talked about before but like what's the next step for this stuff so i'll also speak in a way where you know like what we have built through metaverse is understanding of this thesis where i think there'll be infinite number of nfts right like the same way we can wish so hard that people don't make so many nfts and flood the market but we've opened up a new technology which allows you to just create something and that means that there're going to be infinite number of nfts and in that world obviously like if you think about this moment and say one or two years from now there'll be a exponential number of nfts that exist so what is happening today in a sense could mean that there is more demand than supply right and in a year if there is lot more supply and then there is demand it's going to really affect the whole market and people's mindset and it's also going to create this moment where people are going to think oh i thought this artist will not release more nfts right it's going to create that feeling or it's going to give people the feeling that oh i thought nba top shots is not going to release more of these moments and that feeling when it hits them i think there will definitely be a sobering of this whole industry where the prices right now if you think about the highest priced item people are anchoring it to that and then saying what is the next best priced item and the next best priced item so maybe my item is worth this much right but in my thesis what i feel like is that most of the value 
is going to accrue to a few pieces of this NFT. They are going to capture so much attention of this world and they're going to be so relevant and popular in this world. And most of the NFTs, there'll be no secondary market for it because people will be like, yeah, I can just buy a different moment or I can buy another moment from another guy, which looks very similar. But as a collector, what we have done is not focus on quantity, but you know, the qualitative moments. With art, we don't have more than 300 pieces. And 300 pieces is a lot because we collect each one of them by like really looking at them and seeing if that will hold value. And most of the art we bought is not high valued, right? Like this Christie's auction, I think whatever we paid, it's going to be an interesting number over years. Because if NFT is going to stay relevant for a year or two, I think it's made its value because it's going to be so hard to keep that kind of attention on something with people's attention always changing. So that's my overall thesis where what I'm trying to say is instead of looking at 1000 NFTs and investing $100 in each of them, maybe there'll be one NFT that's worth $100,000. But it might not be the NFT you are investing your money in, right? And it's very rare and very hard to identify those stories and moments. And if you do identify one of them, it's like finding a gem. As a collector, you have to make sure you do something about it, you know, like to bring more attention to it, to keep it relevant, or else the narrative will die and that NFT will just become, you know, a token in your wallet and no one will care about it. One of the things that really speaks to me in terms of NFTs is the disintermediation of the platform and the ability to directly connect the artist with their audience. But, you know, what you just said kind of opened my eyes to another angle, which I think is equally important that you just mentioned. You talked about NFTs as something that you, the owner, invests in, not invests money, but invests time and effort into kind of keeping the focus or bringing focus or creating and weaving a story, as you talked about it before, around that NFT. And it sounds like you are speaking of the NFT as kind of a focus point for you working with the artist to give meaning to this story and no longer really separating artist and audience. And I thought that was a really interesting way to look at it. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. And you did identify a very interesting area because that's something a lot of people miss also. So when we talk about disintermediating this whole industry where artists and fans uh, have maybe a platform in the middle, like say Instagram or whatever, right? Like, And there has been this problem where Instagram probably takes most of the money and artists don't make any money. And in another side of things, there could be an artist, there could be managers or record labels in the middle and the fans on the other side. So the whole economic model of how an artist works is what is changing. So it's not that the artist is connecting directly with his fans, but there is this possibility of a decentralized record label, right? A decentralized Instagram. There are all these middleware between artists and fans because it's impossible for the artist again to connect with all his fans. The whole industry came about because the number of people the artists can connect to is very limited again. And the number of fans could be so much that, you know, you required some kind of middleman who could manage it for you. So now, instead of looking at NFTs as collecting as a fan, you can also make your own business here and become kind of a decentralized middleman. Why I mean decentralized middleman is that you are not able to lock in the artist or lock in the fan. And as a middleman here, you're open to competition from any other person who also wants to work on the same artist's NFTs. And the way to differentiate yourself here in this middle layer would be to find a niche and really become big in that. I will give you an example of that. So NFTs are now thought about 
as collectibles, art, etc. But even if you think about art, we're not only thinking about art in a single dimension where we are all looking at, oh yeah, this is art, right? But once you split them into, you know, there could be artists from Japan who I have no idea of, and I would not be able to identify them and collect them. But a collector in Japan would be able to identify and collect them and thereby become the niche person who understands Japan. There could be a Singapore one, there could be an India one, there could be a Thailand one. And all this is a lot of manual work. So it's not easy, is all I'm trying to say. And there is so much scope for new industries to be created in this area and so much scope for a lot of job descriptions also to be created in this area. So in an environment in which access to creating art and the ability to make a living as an artist has opened up because of digital media, and we've seen that with music, we've seen that with video, and we're seeing it even more now with NFTs, very, very quickly, you find an environment that's saturated with content, that's saturated with creators. And then you have the emergence of not intermediaries, but curators. And these curators have different names depending on which industry they're in. But I remember telling a friend back in 2001, I said, you know, if you look at Moore's Law and you look at hard drives, at some point, a music player, I think it was maybe 2005, actually. A music player at some point will have enough disk capacity to store more songs than you can play for the rest of your life on shuffle. And then what you really need is a DJ. So all of the value shifts from do I own the song and am I able to discover the music I like to the value proposition of can someone create a mood for me? Can someone understand what I'm looking for and cater to my perspective, my point of view, my artistic sensibility or whatever, and help me find the art that fits that. And I think that's really a very big and overlooked aspect of this, which is we're seeing an environment in which there are no longer gatekeepers as to who can be an artist or can't be an artist and still make a living. And it's now possible to distribute the art anywhere in the world. And then you arrive at meta problems for which you need meta curators just like a dj becomes an artist themselves yeah and in a way this whole perspective has also come through me through experience right so when i started with nfts i didn't feel this way right but i had the same question when i was collecting a few nfts the first few were okay because there were not a lot of competition and i will just collect them and then after some time, I felt like there was another collector who was wanting the same piece. Now it's about deciding our budget. And I had no way to figure out what my budget was, right? Because how much will I pay for this? Like, I don't have a value model for this, right? So I used to go into auctions, sometimes like also let myself be outbid by stuff. For example, I lost the auction on Beeple's first stop, which went for $66,000, right? And the same piece sold in four months for $6.6 .6 million. Now, like I've always think to myself, was that a mistake, right? Where should I have gone more? Because it looks like it has more value. But instead of thinking about it like that, it gives me a lot of peace and perspective when I look at an NFT and I can understand and tell what I want to do with it, right? And maybe I want to build a gallery with it. Maybe if it's just land, which is also an NFT, maybe I want to build a gallery on the land, right? So all these kind of what the NFT allows me to do implicitly or explicitly is what gives value to that NFT. And that's very different from physical art which had only the bragging rights. Here you can do a lot more and still have the bragging rights also. Do you ever find yourself battling cynicism in the way that people perceive these things? I certainly find that very much like you find in conservative circles, 
there's a dismissive attitude towards modern art. And people will say, I don't understand it. I don't see why it's valuable. I don't see why it requires skill. And, you know, if you look back at how people like Warhol or other modern artists or even Picasso would treat it for their work, in their time, they were dismissed by a lot of serious analysts and critics as inferior to classics. We see the same now. Do you find yourself exhausted by this kind of cynicism or how do you respond to it? How do you handle that constant wave of cynicism? It's a very emotional point you just made there for me because I'm perfectly all right with people not getting it. In fact, I feel like if less people get it, I have less competition. So, you know, <laughs> NFTs will be less advice, right? So that's perfectly all right because that's why even what happened at Christie's right now, we talk about it as a competition between like maybe 20 people and maybe two in reality. But if people really understand what we were trying to do here, maybe I would have had more competition. And it's all the decentralized class would be bidding. So, no, I was really worried that, you know, like someone like CZ might come into the picture. <laughs> like, because people, if they understand just the signaling part, it's going to be huge. So I'm not too worried about the cynicism itself because that's how Bitcoin was also. No one accepted Bitcoin. People used to make fun of me when I said, like I went through Y Combinator <laughs> and I was the only person who lived on Bitcoin. And there was a shift in my same batch that got acquired by Coinbase, right? So I was their first customer with a card, with a nameless card. I used to spend Bitcoins for my bagels. And people used to make so much fun of me, right? Because they were like, are you stupid? You should have something else. And now I look like a genius, right? <laughs> but, you know, back then, it's not the same. So I think crypto has given me that thick skin to handle cynicism. I just tell people who really are cynical about it and negative about it that they don't have to care about it, right? Like, go do something else. But the one thing that really, I should not say affects me, but affects people around me also is the fact that there is a difference. Like, I sometimes feel like because I am doing this, like I, from my background and who I am, like instead of just being cynical about something, people always try to find some other scheme behind it. And I don't know if it's me or because I'm from this industry or whatever, but people always try to attach a bad intent to it, right? Like there is fraud, there's someone is trying to scam someone. They're looking for an agenda behind all of this. Yeah, people don't understand it. I mean, that's the kind of big thing. So when you don't understand it, right, you try and kind of invent the rationale that what could be driving it. And I think, again, this is what we've been talking about with the perspective that you have on a lot of this stuff is that it's just kind of hard for people who aren't as deep into this to really think about it in that way. And so... I mean, like, <laughs> I read the Amy Castor piece on you, and it did have a number of theories about how you were making money off of these things, or it was a, you know, like a conspiracy between you and Beeble and the thing. And it's just like, well, but Justin Sun was right there, right? Like, it's not like you were bidding up the price by yourself. That just, like, happened. Yeah, like, I'm not saying I don't have motives, but definitely it's very long term, right? And if it's on the blockchain, right, like people claiming that, you know, there is a, something to do with B20, they can just look at the blockchain and you will know the truth because blockchain is one single place of truth. I cannot hide my tokens or anything, right? Like that's my intention. And so sometimes when people see that who are around me, I'm okay to have that thick skin because I know that in the long term, I'll be fine. But, you know, like people around me and people who might want to partner with me, like, it's very simple. People say if there is smoke, probably there is fire. So, like, these kind of things really affect me a lot, not personally, but in terms of business, in terms of wanting to talk to people, work with them, because that will be the first thing they get introduced about me, right? Not me talking to them or not looking at what I've done. Even people who talk like that, cynical and really, it's the negative part. They have not even visited these museums or they don't understand, right? Like, and there are a lot of people who call themselves proudly no coiners. And like, I'm surprised and 
really feel weirded about it because I'm like, okay, it's like kind of being an atheist, right? Like being a no-coiner, you should just be doing something else. Yeah, you're not affected by any of this. So why do you care? I think I've had the same kind of development of thick skin. I'm always amazed when I see these critics who are constantly fighting against Bitcoin. And, you know, why do you care? In many cases, the answer is really simple. You can build an entire career around being a contrarian in this space, no matter how many years you're wrong in a row. But at the same time, they try to make me care. Every now and then I get invited to go and debate someone, you know, go and explain this to, I don't know, Peter Schiff or Narendra Modi. <laughs> like, no, <laughs> why? No, <laughs> I don't care if they understand it or not. I don't care if they get it or not. In fact, I'm quite happy if they don't. The real question is, I'm much more interested in explaining it to a billion people in simple terms for whom it might actually make a difference in their life. Yeah, exactly. Even if we develop the thick skin, I always feel bad about, you know, people around me because they are not used to that kind of criticism. And sometimes a lot of people around me, my family, my friends, they're all very, you know, like close to me. And those people are my strength, right? So when they see something like negative, sometimes it affects them more than it would affect me. And, you know, sometimes I would have to make them feel better <laughs> instead of trying to make me feel better. And yeah, these things happen a lot. But I think it's part of, you know, the same thing. It's part of the rise of the new decentralized class. And so we are not going to get an easy way out of this. But I really appreciate, you know, the kind of support that I've been getting from inside the industry and people who worked with me previously to tell that, you know, all these things are just narratives and it's fine. And it's been so nice to see that kind of love from within the industry. And that gives me a lot of energy. I hope that we'll still be able to maintain this kind of optimism. So let me flip it on its head a bit and say, right now, we look like geniuses for believing in Bitcoin. 18 months ago, we look like utter idiots. And, you know, many of us, Vinesh, you too, of course, we've been through this cycle four or five times now. And it's funny because I can already see that there may be a time in a month, next week, in a year, who knows, where everybody goes, see, I told you Bitcoin was going to die. It's catastrophically collapsed and destroyed to 25,000. And that's it. That's the end. Or whatever the narrative is going to be this time. So let's say that happens again, and let's say it happens to the NFT market. Right now, we're riding high. We look like geniuses. How do you feel about that thought that, you know, in 10 months, 18 months, things may be very different for the NFT space again? Definitely in terms of price moments, right? Like there is definitely an emotional side to it during the winter. We almost don't celebrate, right? Like anything, even the conferences are a little... You know, they have that sad undertone to it. And, <laughs> and usually when it's a bull market, I think that's the way of life, right? Like where, you know, we have to celebrate and also we have to go through that phases. So with the NFT market also, I don't think it'll just be up and up, not just terms of price. I mean, in terms of attention, there'll be again a dry phase of no one caring about NFTs. But what could be different here? I feel like it's similar to what conferences did to crypto. So crypto conferences were very interesting because it kind of was therapeutic to me in a lot of ways because I could meet these people and know these people are real and they have the real intention, right? And that kept me going for the whole winter. So if you are investing in crypto and you've not been to conferences, probably you will not have the same kind of confidence because the internet is very different from meeting people in person in any ways, right? And especially, I think the best times I've had have been Ethereum DevCons and that travel around the world with the whole crew, right? Like just going along and seeing different places and also at the same time having that positivity being reinforced because of the character of people involved in this. So with NFTs also, what's going to happen is we're going to have 
like real huge physical events but it may not be just technical right so it could have music it could have art installations it could be a lot of fun so that's something i'm looking forward to as the covid slowly dies down even 2000 people 3000 people together in the same venue maybe how say tomorrow land started right it could be a movement from within our industry where people meet each other in person and that could take them through the winter and people who come there i don't think they will never you know totally completely reject nfts and reject the idea of crypto and it'll be a lot of fun so i think that's how we'd keep it going well folks that's a wrap on another episode of speaking of bitcoin Today's episode featured Medicoven, Andreas M. Antonopoulos, Stephanie Murphy, and myself, Adam Beetlebean. This episode featured music by Jared Rubens with editing by Jonas. If you enjoyed this episode, send us an email at adam at speakingofbitcoin.show. And to all of you listening, we really can't thank you enough. In an increasingly strange world, it's really important to find your tribe, but especially those of you who have been listening since the early days, you know, thank you. <laughs>